this about child rights and uh, again, <laughs> this is sociology of children, uh, of children's rights and also uh, child relations. Yeah, so it's quite interesting indeed. I should touch my car. Yes, please. I don't have mine, but I'll definitely drop your mail yeah. and introduce you to George as well. Yeah. So that would be easy. Thank you. I think I, I, I met him in some other occasion that maybe he may talk about me. Okay. Yeah. I mean, this like there's so much happening nowadays. So yeah, yeah. Thank you. But I'll make sure to read. So especially since you're thinking about the hotline, yeah. just to talk to you. Yeah, yeah. So some of the things that we do is we do field so hotline letters every day. Mm-hmm. Or like if someone calls them up and says that their account is hacked mm-hmm. or you know they are being bullied or harassed, um, how can they immediately refer them to our platforms and things like that? Yeah. So we should get more. Yeah. yeah. And I think uh, both letters are quite similar. Yeah. Yeah. This is also maybe community input Hello, and contribution. Yeah. yeah, without one of them. I think um, we're going to start in one minute if you want to take your seats because it's already 4.13. Yeah, yeah, 5.10. <laughs> yeah, because the other session starts at five. I think we can stretch the mic. It was really, really good. Okay. The worst thing about working with women is looking at them. And you love an interruption forever. Do we still have a Do we have enough chairs? Yes, please, sir. In there. Thank you. Okay. Can I use the chairman? I would not do the same voice. No, that's okay. I don't want to kiss you. <laughs> well, we have to. He's, well, he's it could be sexual harassment, <laughs> actually. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the Which issue. Which of the two? Yeah. Don't so, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, this is a packed uh, table, but I think we can manage. Um, my name is. Uh, can we start? Is someone recording? Can we, is there any tex- technician around? I'm not sure. No? Okay. I think, I I think we s- we're actually yeah. looking at what you're looking at on the screen, uh, John. That's my screen. Oh, that, that's my, yeah. are you reading anything that, uh, um, <laughs> that you want to hide from us now? <laughs> no, no. Is it shareable? My, my holiday snaps will not be <laughs> <laughs> Okay, aren't we supposed to have some kind of transcript or something on the screen? No, not in this room. Okay.
It may be that it's just not projecting because you've got the computer plugged in. Could it? Could you? Could you? Sorry about that. Oh, this is okay. Well, I get. I, I'm not even sure if it's officially. I'm used to having like someone from the. Anyway, I'll stop speaking. We we see what happens. I hope it's recorded. Can you can you check if there is because we have a live webcast maybe to see if it's. So that means you recorded. it. Okay, thank you. Okay, excellent. So I can smile. We are being recorded. You cannot smile. So my name is Marie Laure Le Mineur. I work for ECPA International. Um, this is a, an NGO, uh, a network of NGOs. We have uh, uh, right now 103 members, over 100 members based in 93 countries. And uh, the remit of uh, our organization is to combat all forms of sexual exploitation, um, being one of them being uh, the sexual exploitation of children online. And uh, uh, ECPAT is chairing the Dynamic Coalition on China Online Safety. We have over 40 members, all children's rights organization. Um, so I would like to thank you for attending the session today. And uh, the topic that is bringing us today actually, um, of course, I find it very interesting because uh, we actually <laughs> wrote the proposal, but I think it's a challenging one and, and uh, we can um, manage to have a very uh, interactive session and, and, uh, and discuss interesting points. It's uh, the moderation of illegal content online and the staff welfare and discuss a little bit um, the responsibility of the actors involved uh, in this matter. So we have uh, different panelists today. Um, some of them you might know. Um, we have with us John Carr, who is actually um, on my left-hand side, mm -hmm. over there. Uh, John uh, wears many hats. Some of, uh, of you might know him. But uh, today he's speaking in his capacity as senior advisor of ECPA International. Then we have uh, Larry on my uh, right-hand side. Larry also has a long CV and wears many hats. Um, but today he's speaking in his capacity as a member of the uh, safety advisory board of Facebook, Twitter, and Snapchat. Is that correct? And to some extent, Google, yeah. Uh, yeah. And Google? To some extent, yeah. Oh, excellent. Depending <laughs> if they ever have their meetings, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <When they> have. <laughs> then we have Marco Pansini. Marco is the director of the EU policy, public policy uh, for Google. And then, yes, Marco. Then we have Karuna Naim, who is the head of a global safety. Policy program for Facebook, and last but not least, we have uh, Michael Turks. Turks. Thank you. Sorry, uh, who is also a policy manager um, for IWF, right, yeah. uh, Internet Watch Foundation, who is the reporting mechanism in the UK, uh, reporting mechanism for illegal content, CSAM, uh, child abuse images. So what we'll do today is that um, John is going to frame a little bit uh, the topic raise some questions, make some comments. Then we'll pass on the mic. The speaking order will be like this for the first round. Then we'll pass on the mic. Oh, sorry. I just realized I forgot to introduce <laughs> our remote moderator. I'm so sorry, David. Uh, okay. <laughs> David is helping us. He's from uh, e, e, -help e Help Association from Hong Kong. Uh, has been involved with IGF and ICANN for a long time and he's helping us. Thank you very much, his okay. remote moderator. My apologies. So after John makes the uh, frames the debate, then we will pass the mic to um, um, to Michael, um, so that he can explain to us a little bit what the the welfare uh, program is, and then we'll continue with the other speakers. And then uh, we want to keep the session very interactive. So uh, any moment you want to ask a question or you want to react on something that has been done after the the first round please feel free to sort of intervene and raise your hands and uh, so that we it's not that structured on purpose so that it's more lively and more interesting to all of us so john um yep. over to you okay no. oh i can see that there is a transcript now on the screen so it's working it's, uh, everything's good yeah perfect thank you Okay, so um, we got interested in this as an organization, that's to say ECPAT International, uh, following, I think it was ori originally me, but other people then read a book written by an academic from Western University in California, a book called Digital Refuse. 
and what what the academic uh, what uh, Sarah Roberts uh, is academic what she did in that book was look at where the rich countries of the world uh, you know the OECD member states predominantly but Western Europe America Australia Japan and so on where where were they sending all of their old computers uh, where were they sending their old TV sets old refrigerators and all of these sorts of bits of metal and technology that were no longer useful, no longer had passed their working life and needed to be dumped, needed to be got rid of. And uh, what she found was that there were lots of, and this is not new, everybody kind of knew this, there were businesses who'd been set up specifically to transport these bits of metal to different parts of the world um, to, to to unload them, to, to dump them. I think sometimes they would try and retrieve bits of precious metal that were in old old mobile phones or old old computers. But in essence, uh, what 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 she traced were the places around the planet where these old bits of technology, dead bits of technology, were being dumped. And then, uh, and then she I don't quite know what inspired her to do it, but it was inspirational. And then she looked at where. Uh, the bad images and the bad stuff that was appearing on the internet was being viewed by moderators who, who were having to then make decisions or be part of the decision-making chain in big internet companies about whether or not this particular content was either illegal or uh, contravened the terms of service or community standards of the company that had hired them to do the moderation. And what she found was that there was almost an exact match. So the countries where the West were sending their old computers and their old TV sets to get buried in the ground, or whatever it might be, uh, in parts of the developing world, were the same countries where people were being employed to look at the, vid uh, the, the visual digital outputs, as it were, um, that was coming predominantly w when the book was written, and I think probably still largely, from the same countries. Um, and then, uh, and she described in the book some of the kinds of things that the moderators were having to look at. Uh, and, you know, videos of beheading, child abuse images, child pornography, whatever you want to call it, children being beaten up, all kinds of horrible, horrible things that these people, these moderators, were having to look at on behalf of the companies who, that, who, who were employing them. Uh, I think typically in those days they were all working as subcontractors for moderation companies. Very few, I think, in those days were uh, direct employees of the companies who had asked them to do the moderation. Um, and she was very concerned about what was happening to them as people. So in the name of protecting free speech, in the name of all of these sorts of things, the reality was that, that there were these people in, the third, in third world countries or developing world countries who were having to look at this stuff as it were, on our collective behalf. And uh, the wages were very low, the working conditions were not very good, and in one particular case, uh, this company, she didn't name it, but I, I don't think it would take much imagination to work out which one it was. Not only were they, they were employing subcontractors in these offices, uh, in particular, there was the, uh, she visited offices in Manila, where some of these moderators were being viewed, and she also went to the head office of the same company, where they also employed a smaller number of moderators, but they, these people were in head office. And what she found was a great difference in the way in which uh, these moderators were being, uh, as it were, looked after. The ones who were in Manila, almost no kind of services, no kind of support, the screens were open, s things of this kind. The ones who were being employed in head office back in the USA, their screens were all kind of sequestered and in, they were in a safe room and there was there were it was very difficult for anybody else to see anything that was going on the screen the only people who could see the stuff was, was the actual moderator themselves so there's a big difference in other words between the terms and conditions under which these moderators were subcontractors were doing this job and the moderators who were being employed in in head office back in uh, back in california or seattle or, or wherever it wherever it might be and I think in part of what she also found was that some of these moderators were working from home. So they, they were home workers. So they were doing this job, looking at this horrible, horrible stuff in their living rooms. 
if they, or the equivalent of a living room or whatever, whatever it was that they had. So we had had this sort of image of these, and they, overwhelmingly they were women, poor women who were working for you know a dollar a day or something like that, uh, maybe maybe slightly more than that, but certainly not a great deal more than that. Looking at this horrible stuff, maybe with their children running around in the house or other people coming in and moving around, and it, just all of it seemed a little bit kind of off. So we thought it would be good uh, to raise this as, as, as an issue at a, at a meeting of this kind because what these people are doing on our behalf is in the name of free speech. I mean, they are, they are the ones who are actually at the coalface trying to make sure that the internet is the kind of place we all want it to be, but they're the ones who are paying a very heavy price. One of, one of, the, uh, one of the people who, uh, who Sarah Roberts interviewed was a psychiatrist and a psychologist who got called in to help some of the people in Manila. And the when, when the psychologist or psychiatrist heard the kinds of material that these people were having to look at, she had to go and get help herself, just as it were from this indirect contact with it. So it just seemed to me that there were obvious personal welfare issues, child protection issues, and so on and so forth that ought to be aired because it's not an issue that has been discussed very much. And it's been given added sort of moment, I guess, by the announcement recently, the very welcome announcements I might add, from Google and Facebook about the number of moderators that they're going to be, uh, they're going to be employing. We, we don't know how many moderators they're employing at the moment, uh, but Google have said, for example, that they in intend to employ another 10,000 by the end of next year, and Facebook have said that they intend to uh, increase the number of moderators that they employ by 20,000, I think it is. I don't know exactly what the time frame is. So, and this is not, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure this is a good thing in general because it will help deal with some terrible content that's on there. But uh, it seemed to me that as more and more moderators in combination with artificial intelligence or whatever were being engaged, that this was a timely kind of opportunity to, to think about some of the wider issues. Final point on this, because we don't have very long and there's lots of other people want to talk. I was one of the original directors of the British uh, Internet Watch Foundation back in 1996-97. I am very old, you can probably tell that. Um, where we had to face this, now at the time we only had two, two staff. One was the chief executive and one was the deputy chief executive. They had great titles, but, uh, but, <laughs> but, but they were the people who actually had to look at the images. And we, we became acutely aware, as their employers, if you see what I mean, that we had a duty of care to them. Now, since that time, the IWF has expanded hugely. I don't know exactly what the arrangements are now, but I'm very happy to hand over to Michael, who's going to tell us. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> um, thanks very much, John. Um, I think there are some really interesting points that you just picked up on there. Um, certainly, you know, around the, the psychiatrist who is indirectly engaging in this content needing to have uh, access to help and support and I think that really does just show um, what an issue that we are we are dealing with here. Um, firstly I'd just like to say thank you to Mary Law for um, inviting the IWF to participate in this panel um, and for those of you that, that don't know um, about the IWF so we are the UK's hotline um, to remove child sexual abuse material. Um, we have an online reporting portal where members of the public can report uh, online child sexual abuse images or images that they believe to be child sexual abuse. Um, and that is then assessed by our team of analysts in, in Cambridge. And our mission is to eliminate child sexual abuse material from the internet. We're an independent, not-for-profit organisation and also, as John alluded to, a self-regulatory body that works with the internet industry, government and law enforcement to tackle this issue. Probably one of the biggest game-changing moments for the IWF was in uh, 2014 when the former UK Prime Minister David Cameron authorised us to proactively search for content. And the reason that this was a game-changing moment is because it then meant that our analysts were seeing huge volumes of content and much more content than they'd ever seen before. And to give you an indication of what that looked like, in 2013, uh, the figures from 2013 where we didn't do proactive searching, uh, to the 2014 figures where proactive searching was included, we saw a 138% increase in the material that our analysts were discovering. And clearly this uh, has had a significant impact on our staff. Just to give you an idea of what our 
analysts see on a daily basis it is truly appalling. So they see everything from images of children being brutally raped and abused and beaten to beheading videos that aren't within our remit but are sent in because the members of the public are concerned about what the content they are seeing is to perhaps potentially some hilarious uh, videos and images coming in of, for example, cats dancing around in, in people's underwear that they believe just shouldn't be on the internet. Um, so there are, some, there are some lighter moments for our analysts um, as well. But on a serious note, our analysts do an extraordinary job. They're ordinary people doing an extraordinary job. And they are our superheroes, I think. And last year they took down 60,000 individual web pages of uh, child sexual abuse material. And what's significant about that figure is that each individual web page contain up, can contain up to hundreds um, and thousands of uh, indecent images of children. <coughs> We've actually, from on those images, we found that 50% of those images are children under the age of 10, and 10% of those uh, under the age of two. When we're assessing these images, we assess them in line with UK law, um, and we assess under an A, B, C system. A being the most severe forms of abuse, which usually involves penetration. B probably involving um, or oral, um, and C involving uh, any material that then focuses specifically on a child's genital region. So really some, some quite hard-hitting stuff that that we see. 65% of the content for under twos is category A abuse, so the most severe form of abuse that you can imagine. And these are the very, very worst acts. We have around 38 staff that we employ at the IWF, so as John was saying, we've grown, we've grown a lot um, since the days where, where John was the director. And we have about 20 people in the IWF that are actively engaged in viewing child sexual abuse uh, material in some form or another. And there are two, I suppose, really big welfare issues um, for the IWF. The first is obviously the impact uh, that this has on the analysts themselves. And I agree with John that there really isn't and really hasn't been enough work done in this area to analyse what the impact is from a psychological point of view. But secondly, there is also the welfare of the of the IWF to consider as well. So one of the worst case scenarios for the IWF would be if someone that was analysing this content was doing so for their own sexual gratification in some way. So we also make sure that we monitor what work they are looking at in the hotline um, to spot any trends uh, which might flag up some uh, impeculiar be behaviour or peculiar behaviour. So we look at that. I just want to talk a little bit about the recruitment processes that we go through to make sure that we get the right people. So we're looking for people that are really good data processors, but we also want to um, ensure that they have the right resilience and support networks around them as well. So the recruitment process starts off by them having a psychological assessment and an, an, in, an interview really to understand what their support networks are around them and could they cope with the level of imagery that I've just described. Secondly, they're then put through um, what would be more of a competency-based interview just to check that they are able to do the job and have those analytical skills that we're looking for. And finally, the last part of the process is that we show them, um, they can't usually come in on a Friday, we show them some images, um, gradually getting worse as they go through, <coughs> and then they have the weekend to reflect on how, those, on how they feel about those Im images. And over the weekend, they have access to psychological support and support from the IWF um, uh, and in independent psychological support as well after that viewing session to mitigate any impact on them. Of course, it's not for everyone, so there is an opportunity for them to drop out of the process. Um, and then following that, when they're successful, there is a six-month um, in induction period for them. So in the first week, they spend a great deal of time with the hotline manager acclimatising to the new environment that they find themselves in. And again, this is no um, ordinary job. We also try to ensure that the working environment is as best as it can be for our staff. So uh, the analysts are able to take breaks whenever they want. Um, there are enforced breaks for certain activities, such as image hashing, where they'll be seeing so many images flicking through 
a very, very fast rate that every 15 minutes we actually say they need to take uh, a, a break. Um, we also provide mandatory counselling support, so all of the analysts have to go to counselling once a month, and that reduces the stigma of someone going to counselling um, within the office uh, where others might not. It takes that stigma away because they all have to do that. Um, we also run a series of away days, which improves the relationship between those that work in the hotline and those that don't. Um, because, you know, it's strange, the only time that I see some of my colleagues is in the kitchen, because we have a big wall down the middle of our office that, that absolutely uh, divides us. So it's really great. Around three times a year we get together um, and have away days, which improves the team bonding. Our analysts are also uh, subject to uh, annual psychological assessments, which just checks in with them um, in terms of uh, their, their, their well-being. And finally, I just want to say um, just a note on technology and how I think technology can um, improve uh, s some of the welfare conditions that we're facing. So we know through our URL list and our image hash, hash list that there are images of children that are repeated throughout the web. We are looking at, we, we do our best to take those down and make sure that they're prevented from spreading again, but we put them, we're developing a program of web crawlers which enables us to put those images into a web crawler to find other images or duplicates or where there are possibilities for other images to be in the future. Um, and eventually where we're trying to get to with that is that those images will return other images that we don't know about, which will go through to assessment, but the known images will be blanked out, so our analysts won't have to see images in the future that they have already confirmed as being child sexual abuse images. So I think that there is, there is a, a real possibility for technology to expand further in this space. Thank you very much, Michael. Very interesting. Um, Karuna, do you want to react on this and then Marco maybe? Thank you. Thank you so much for having Facebook as part of this discussion. And as you can imagine, this is very, very important for us as a company to get right because the well-being of our moderators is super critical for us. Um, the way we want to try uh, at Facebook, the way that we try and do this is, let me take a step back actually. So how it works on Facebook is that when people see content on their newsfeed or posts that they think that should not be on Facebook, they have the option to click report to let us know that this should not be on our platform. They can also go to our help center to find standalone forms where can they can report some types of content uh, directly to the teams. When they select the re report option, they, we ask them a series of questions to help us triage the reports to figure out which is the best team that that report should go to. And why is that important? Because we have teams of trained people on specific subject matters that we want you know, handling these reports. But we also know that when people are clicking these options, they may not choose the correct one. So all our teams are trained across our entire gamut of community standards. So even if I am an expert on suicide prevention, I should still know what the other content standards are so that if the report does not violate the community standard that the person thought it was violating, but violated something else, they would be still get the resolution that they need. So that's how reporting on Facebook works, and that's how reports go to specific teams around the world in terms of reviewing. We also have a uh, team, we, we also try and make sure that our reviewers are uh, native language speakers, because we know that, you know, if um, I'm, just because I learned Spanish for two years in college, I should not be reviewing a report in Spanish, because I won't know local cultural nuances. So that's another thing that we take care of. So our moderators are not just content experts, they are native language speakers, and they're trained across our entire range of community standards. Uh, there's, we, well, we want to make sure that they have the psychological support and wellness programs in place so that they can reach out whenever they need it. But, you know, we want to make it even deeper than that because one of the things that we've learned is that there is no one size fits all. Each person reacts to content and to uh, different pieces of that content. So I might find comments and text more uh, triggering than I might find the photograph or the video. So each person is different. When they require that kind of support is different. And you know what is going to impact them is going to be very different. So we want to try and make it as tailor-made to each person's needs. And the way that we've successfully managed to do that is by making sure that the team, you know, wellness and psychological well-being is prioritized for the team on the whole. Uh, managers are incentivized for focusing on wellness of the team members. It is. Uh, any team member should be able to go out and talk to each other when they are feeling stressed, when they are looking at something which is 
causing them uh, pain or making them uncomfortable, they should be able to go out and speak to their fellow team members and get the support and help that they need. So we need to make that environment in the team so that they feel they're able to come and have these conversations on the floor. Um, it's also important to put things into perspective. Most of the content that comes to these reviewers is pretty much just cat and dog videos, a lot of garbage that comes along these reporting flows. Very small percentage is the very, very um, violent or, you know, graphic content, which would be, which is very, is very, very hard to look at and is very impactful. Uh, so it's not like they're constantly getting that barrage of content. It comes in the queues, uh, but it's like a very small percentage. So I just want to put that into perspective because, you know, sometimes you get the vision that they're sitting there and they're just seeing one after the other bad content. It's a whole mixed bag that could come their way. Um, but our main goal is to build very strong team structures where people feel that they have the support and the help they need. We also want to make sure that they have uh, the psychological support and wellness programs in place which they can utilize when they need it. Um, and also we want to make sure that we don't try and project a one-size-fits-all approach because it is very different. Each person's needs are very different. In terms of our outsourcing partners, we've chosen to work with only very highly reputable global partners who take care of their employees. We also make sure that it's contractually mandated for them to have wellness and psychological programs in place. I'm trying to think if I've missed anything. Um, I think that's about it. Thank you. So, uh, so, so all of the moderators that you're having out are working for outsourcing companies? Not all. Uh, Some of them. Some of them. Some of them. Okay, so uh, if I understand well what, from what you said is that when you hire the uh, company, the outsourcing company, then there are some requirement, prerequisites, so that... That is correct. Yes. Yeah, that is correct. Okay, thank you very much. And do you know how many hours, uh, you, you the ones who are based at, let's say, at the company facing, do you know how many hours so they work? So it varies by the type of content that they're going to be reviewing. For some content, we want to make sure that they're not hitting too many hours on exactly. those cues. Uh, you know, there are different types of coping mechanisms also which are advocated. So, for instance, one of the ones that really caught my attention was that the, uh, the reviewer wears a certain set of clothes in office and when they're about to reach the house, they take off that set of clothes and they leave it in the office because they want to distance themselves from uh, their work and, you know, and their personal life. Uh, limiting the number of hours in certain queues is another thing <coughs> which we are very specific about. So there are different best practices which we've adopted, which, you know, um, and the other thing which we are doing is we are working very closely across industry. So, for instance, at the Crimes Against Children conference last year in Dallas, we had somebody from our team come and present on what these best practices and what these, you know, uh, various coping mechanisms are uh, so that other people could also learn and, you know, and share what they were doing. Um, the Technology Coalition is coming up with a manual of best practices across the companies uh, and, you know, documenting some of these things so that smaller companies can just pick them up and utilize them for their teams as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Marco, do you want to um, yes, speak now? <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for having us today discussing this important issue. So when I received your invitation, I went directly to our team that is dealing with these issues because I think that there is something that is really bothering me sometimes is that we, we end up in talking about things that we don't know uh, or we heard from or we were briefed by mm -hmm. other people and that's not uh, really helping. So I went straight <coughs> to the source as to uh, one of our, my colleagues that is working on, on, on this issue, actually a people manager, and he gave me a good overview on what they are doing in their teams and that's what I will try to do today with the, not the, the presumption to give uh, all the answer but really to give you uh, second hand but still uh, real uh, uh, testimony of, of how a company like Google, employees of a company like Google are dealing with this content. <coughs> so the first thing that he said to me, it was very clear that repeated exposure to disturbing content has a, uh, an impact on, on well-being of people doing this job. That's something that uh, we need to acknowledge and that's something that we need actually to work towards in order to um, mitigate. Also, the, the best protection would be to not use humans in doing this job. Of course, use technology. But we heard today, and in these days in the, the, <laughs> the IGF, but we are hearing also very often how humans are important in the process in order to make sure that the decisions that are taken are balanced and that uh, algorithms are not deciding what should be the content that you can find online. But we still believe that uh, part of the solution to this problem is in developing strong technologies that are helping to identify uh, content, illegal content and uh, controversial <coughs> content. From this point of view, we made a lot of progress. 
in the context of, uh, for example, the, the, the identification of controversial content on YouTube, uh, thanks to the algorithm that we are using, 98% overall of all uh, the flags that we, uh, we are receiving for review in our team are coming from uh, automated uh, search uh, in, in on, on the platforms. What is happening then is, of course, humans still have to review the content, and we try to because of this uh, first uh, uh, like activity to reduce as much as much as possible the exposure to the whole content for these individuals for example not showing the whole video but showing only specific uh, um, specific frames uh, of, of it so taking in consideration that that uh, human you the human factor in this in this process still uh, very relevant. What we are doing in order to mitigate this is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is the following. So there are some best practices that are developed and uh, as, as was said before are across the whole industry. So I won't, I'm going to repeat some of the things that you already heard, but that's actually a good news because it shows that mm -hmm. how this experience is show is, uh, is, 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 is showed. So uh, different dimension. First of all, uh, the, the core of all, uh, of all the process is to make sure that we uh, are assuring a quality of life in, in your job, day-to-day -day life that is, uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, at the highest, uh, highest possible uh, level. In order to do that, we need to take in consideration different factor. Of course, is uh, the fatigue of watching this kind of content, but it's also providing a sense of purpose. Why? Uh, people reviewing this content is uh, is doing this job and the important uh, social role that uh, the, the as, as was uh, highlighted by John before these uh, person are fulfilling and therefore the importance of actually their contribution of the society they are doing and therefore also to work on on their overall personal satisfaction for 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 the uh, the this, this activity and of course avoid any kind of burnout avoid any kind of trauma and in doing that, uh, we, we like scored a kind of uh, flow of, of different things that can be taken. Some of them are about prevention, so taking step, active step to prevent stress from, from uh, like uh, focusing on uh, things like, for example, mindfulness. That's something that we uh, Google at different levels. I would say even in our team, we are very keen of. So try to put yourself in a, in a state of mind, which is uh, um, going beyond your uh, single task and the stress that the single task that you are performing is um, is, 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 uh, is uh, affecting uh, how this aff is affecting you this is, uh, can be done through meditation uh, encouraging hobbies encouraging uh, spending time with friends spending time away from the decks exercise develop your personal uh, uh, personal safety plan and that's something that can be done together with your manager can be done in the context of the um, of the organization then also very important from the manager to identify any sign of stress, any feedback uh, coming from directly the person or the peers or the family. And these uh, can be like signs that come different from different sources. So for of course, uh, illness, physical, um, also physical fatigue is something that has to be taken in consideration. So the observation of the manager is very important and the behavior that of course are compassive or anxiety, um, all, all of these things are, 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 are to be taken in consideration. Then the fourth, uh, third element is countering, taking action against, against the stress when it emerges, which means uh, reconnect with the values of the work that you said before, share the burden with the co-workers, uh, the uh, kind of uh, support uh, both from uh, expert and from your manager in order to, to relax, to, to stretch, to, to, to really um, ac achieve a, a better status. <laughs> And of course, uh, at the last sta uh, stage, uh, in case it needed, uh, talk with the professional, maximize uh, health benefits, make sure that all the employees have a plan in order to get uh, specialized counseling, uh, speak up, uh, have this uh, um, self educate to re resilience, and take action to prevent uh, the situation to getting worse. All of this, we, we try to do it at Google, of course, but also we expand to all our. Uh, vendors we make sure that in the contract with our vendors uh, this uh, flow and this kind of approach to the work life is taken in consideration and and uh, and uh, again that's not a deal done absolutely not is uh, as it was stressed for me from from what Felipe the person I spoke with that there are different uh, 
different ways how this could uh, could evolve and uh, could improve but uh, we fully the message here is that we fully acknowledge about the consequence uh, of this and we we are mindful of the importance of finding solutions very well thank you very much larry over to you well first of all <coughs> i want to congratulate uh, the coalition for taking on this project and especially i want to thank john for bringing up the issue of how this is really impactful in the developing world among people who are extremely underpaid and probably in many cases underserved by the kinds of um, uh, resources that Google and Facebook and certainly Internet Watch Foundation are putting into this. Uh, as it turns out, uh, I was advertised as being on the advisory boards of several of these companies, and while that is true, I think I'm pleased to say that this subject has never come up because when we advise these groups, we advise them more on the actual direct uh, treatment of the constituency, the children and others. So we have not talked about this in any of the advisory groups. However, another hat I do wear is that for the past 20 years I've been on the board of NECMEC, which is the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And NECMEC pioneered the type of work that all of these groups are doing many, many years ago and has long, I, I think for well more than a decade, if not two decades, um, been offering counseling services and screening processes and really making sure that the employees that are work doing this kind of work uh, are getting the resources they need. And just as in the case of the Internet Watch Foundation, where this work is done is in an isolated section of the building, a secure section of the building. Uh, this content, uh, in addition to being extremely distasteful, is also illegal for anybody other than those who are tasked and uh, approved for access to it. So it is something that, uh, in fact, we're in the process of considering moving to a new building. and. One of the things that we are looking at is to make sure we can secure this area and also to make sure that uh, janitors uh, and others that may come into the building to do, to do work who are not employees don't have access to this, uh, the, these areas of the building, which, by the way, are 24-hour a day operation in the case of NECMEC, or at least the reporting lines are. Um, I also want to point out, uh, and again, this gets to the point that John's made, that uh, if you look at the clothing in industry, and Nike in particular had been under tremendous pressure to make sure that its contractors were treating employees the way you would expect a company like Nike to treat its own employees in terms of pay and working conditions. Apple has been under similar pressure in its manufacturing plants in, Fezhen in China and elsewhere. Um, I think it's, it's be incumbent upon the tech industry, not just the giant companies uh, that are happen to be represented at this table, but the startups as well, that they take responsibility for the uh, conditions under which people who are working on their behalf, whether employed or contractual, uh, are, are getting the kinds of treatments that they need. So even if you're a startup, the, uh, the people who are doing the work for you should not be under the kinds of conditions that John articulated. Uh, one of the things that my own uh, small NGO, Connect Safely, is trying to do is to work with, uh, with venture capitalists and others who are involved in the startup process at day zero, day minus one, so to speak. So when companies start the process of uh, rolling out their products, they think about safety on all levels. Now, to be honest with you, until today, it really hadn't occurred to me to be thinking about uh, these kinds of issues. I've been thinking about how they develop safety into their products for their end users, similar to the automobile manufacturers, make sure that they don't ship a car until the brakes and the airbags are installed. That often is not the case when it comes to apps that are starting out serving the needs of young people. But I, having heard this conversation, it occurs to me that we should be adding how they, in fact, treat the contractors who are likely doing this kind of work. Because I suspect, John, and correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. that if today many of these companies are, many of these, the companies that are employing these moderators are the startups and the smaller companies sure. Sure. that don't have the resources that the, uh, the Googles and Facebooks do. So. Uh, you know, I think it's really important um, that all of us in the developed world uh, are fully cognizant of the impact that our garbage, so to speak, is having on those that have to pick through it. I love that analogy from the book because it's very similar uh, and uh, obviously applaud the work that's being done uh, by IWF and, fa and Facebook and Google and, of course, NECMEC uh, for trying as hard as we can to take care of the people that are doing the work. And I'll make one other comment, which is, it's already been mentioned that one of the most serious issues to look at are 
individuals who may be themselves exploiting or getting some kind of sexual gratification or, or some form of gratification from looking at this material. Uh, that can either be a predilection that you can determine in the recruitment process, or it can be an acquired behavior that comes as a result mm -hmm. of the trauma that they're going through. Mm -hmm. And so it's very important, that, and I'm sure you do, that we be constantly reevaluating our employees and also thinking about a, uh, and I, I'd be curious to ask the people on the panel here, uh, whether there's a rotation process, how long someone stays in this role. It strikes me that this should not be the type of career that you start in your 20s and retire from in your 60s, <laughs> but something that you rotate into and out of um, so, so that it doesn't become a lifetime uh, <laughs> job for you. Do you want to answer? Can I ask a question as well? Oh. <laughs> just, just, is there a trade association of moderation companies? Because I'm sure, you know, you guys have got contracts that say with the moderation companies, and if you subcontract mm -hmm. from this contract, you've got to ensure that the same standards are applied. But there must be a whole network, or my sense is there's a whole network of moderation companies springing up all over the world, and whether or not they're being held to the same standards is, is, is another matter. And maybe there's something that we could all do collectively to try to intervene in that space. I think you just found another job. <laughs> <laughs> So I can speak for Facebook, um, and I'm not sure whether we allow subcontracting, so I need to go back and check. Oh, so I, I am honestly not sure that we allow subcontracting. Same thing for me on the subcontracting question, but in terms of tools that are used, again, uh, tools that are using uh, are um, also suggested and included in, in the way the other um, contractors are working with us is uh, providing, for example, privacy screen, uh, having access control and separate space uh, for uh, in order to prevent ac accidental exposure, is develop tools uh, that need to engage with, with the material, um, add blurring, still image distortion capabilities in the reporting tools, so incorporate technologies that eliminate repetitive use, use ensure tools that can be used only within the corporate or in order to avoid the problem that you described before, working from home, ensure ongoing conversation related to career progression and promotion, which I agree with you, Larry, is this is the goal. I mean, I, I, I already had in my um, experience uh, at Google two people coming from this team and now moving to the policy team or moving to different roles, and it's absolutely part of, of the de development. Without considering that the job that the people is doing in reviewing this content is, is not an important job, I'm also working day to day, every day with people from, from these teams, and I think they are amazing in the dedication the understanding of the issues, the contextual, uh, uh, the, context the contextual information that you need to have in order to make uh, an assessment, especially when we speak about, for example, legal aid speech. And so it's a combination of, of, of the things. There's, there are people that uh, is really like thinking that the work that they are doing has a, an impact. When we had IWF, we rotate people in and out of those companies. Yeah, Chris, yeah. Yeah. Um, so Obviously, if we come across uh, someone that is struggling in that role, so what we try and do by building the team environment that we have is we rely on the analysts to keep an eye on each other. So um, we want analysts to spot problems and issues with each other. Um, and there is the ability to take people out of the hotline if they are uh, struggling with any issues that they're facing. So absolutely, uh, you know, our, st our staff's uh, well-being is, is of paramount importance. So we do take them out of the hotline if we need to. And there are measures in place. So our hotline manager, for example, um, monitors what our staff are looking at to spot any of these trends that, that may come out. So if they're looking at inappropriate content um, and it's throwing up some trends. So a, g a good example is one of our former analysts ended up looking at um, an awful lot of, of, of male um, indecent images. Um, so that was flagged up to our hotline manager. And um, as it turned out, that person was removed from the hotline for the period of time to investigate what, that, what, what was going on there. And as it, as it turned out, they were doing nothing wrong. It was just the fact that they had hit a huge scene of child sexual abuse material and kept going and going and going down this scene until they found loads and loads of indecent male images. So it wasn't that they had a, a, a particular poncho for that, for, for, for that sort of imagery, it was just that was where they were being led. So that proves that those safeguarding mechanisms are in place and they work. Um, 
but yes, going back to the point, there is always there is always the ability to be able to take those people out of the hotline and into. But, but what about the notion of the long, you know, that that notion of you know staying in that job for forty years? You haven't been around for forty years. No, no, exactly. But is, is that something that you guys think about? Not wanting to make sure this is a permanent position for these people, or. Um, yeah. I, 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 I couldn't actually say. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure because I started. Th yeah. I started three months ago. Yeah. I, I couldn't actually three say. But, <laughs> but from a personal issue, from a personal point of view, I do, I do think that it is co concerning. Yeah. 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 Irritation. Are you, are, are you at some point giving him hope? The analyst, in hoping to internet association or hotline. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm on the international association of internet hotline. Yeah. I'm, I'm on their advisory board. Yeah, they have a, they have a. A policy which requires all hotlines to have something similar. I doubt there's anybody else other than NECMEC and the IWF and maybe the Canadians who do it to the same standard as, as you guys do, but it is meant to be in place for all of the hotlines. But I don't know if it's policed, I don't know how well it's actually looked at closely, but it's meant to be that. Yeah. Go on, thank Philip. you. It's one of the conditions of membership. Philip, so we have 15 more minutes, 15 more minutes to go. Uh, we can open the floor. Uh, if you have any particular questions, yeah, um, Lou's over there, and then uh, hello. Second and third. Yeah, my name is Natalie. I'm from. Can you speak? <laughs> yes. Can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 Okay. How effective do you think self-regulation is? Um, self-regulation of internet service providers in terms of counter countering such type of internet uh, illegal content. Self-regulation of internet. Self-regulation of illegal content. Internet so service providers do not look at content. I know, but... Um, so what, what would be the... We have a code of conduct uh, by which um, mm -hmm. Internet uh, service providers can control uh, access to the certain types of websites. We're not hearing you. Uh, we have a, a code of conduct uh, which allows Internet service providers in, in case, um, for example, families and households demand to ban certain types of websites. How effective do you think uh, this would be to control the illegal content? Can you, can you s tell us who is we? We I represent Telecom Operators Association. In which country? Georgia. Georgia. Yeah. <laughs> we checked last week in Georgia. Yeah. <laughs> do you want to answer that, or yeah. do you know? I, I mean, some of some of the some of the stuff that NECMEC, the IWF, and Canadian hotlines in particular are doing now, strictly speaking, on a self-regulatory ba regulatory basis, is extremely effective, uh, but and very high tech. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not it's not done casually. It's done on an industrial scale and on a large basis. But there are definitely issues around self-regulation and how, how the, and the transparency. The key to a lot of this is transparency. But from a technical point of view, I think we can do it very well now. Mm. Just that, yeah. So um, as, as John's alluded to, uh, I think self-regulation has worked really well in the space of child sexual abuse material, particularly in the UK. So um, in 1996, when the IWF was founded, the UK was responsible for 18% of child sex abuse material. Now we're responsible for just 0.1%. So you can clearly see the impact that self-regulation has had in that field. Um, we work with the internet industry and I think that's been really effective in terms of taking down illegal content. So now in the UK we're seeing content removed usually within two hours of the provider being notified of that. So I think certainly in this space, um, self-regulation has, has really worked. But I would do agree with John that there are some there are some wider issues around transparency in some of this mm -hmm. as well, um, and transparency of services and what is taken as well from, from the IWF. And in the United States, Internet providers are, are required by law to submit this material to the cyber tip line, which is run by NECMEC. And so while it is somewhat voluntary, it's also mandatory. So at the end of the day, they're, they're complying with the law, and although there are some that don't, and that's a constant struggle to make sure that some of the newer and smaller services uh, are aware of and are in, com in, in compliance. Does that answer your question? You're welcome. I think you're next, please. Uh, da David Ellis from the University of Cambridge. Um, it, it strikes me that, that, that Facebook and Google are in a slight, or YouTube are in a slightly different position from, say, the IWF, because, I mean, it, it's directly users of your services who are disseminating this material. And that, that led me on to the question, 
it seems slightly odd that this is done through terms of service when you're talking about illegality, that mm -hmm. this isn't simply addressed as a, as a law enforcement issue. Mm -hmm. um, do you always report the uh, individual to the police? Uh, do you have procedures <coughs> to escalate and clearly when things do get serious enough, well, what, what, what are your procedures in relation to law enforcement? And are there issues also to bring it back to sort of the theme of the panel? Uh, the, the people who are involved in that sort of relationship, welfare issues or, or, or safety issues, which need to be addressed. So as a US company, we are mandated to report all such cases to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Uh, but if we feel that the child is in imminent danger and uh, you know is in imminent harm, we will reach out to law enforcement and uh, you know activate those channels. But as a US company, we are mandated to report it to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. But, but what about if it's uh, UK or it's Germany? I mean, the user is based in that country, mm -hmm. not, not in the US. And, and I thought that Facebook's based in, in Ireland mainly. We are. <laughs> <laughs> no? Isn't it headqu headquarters is in Ireland? No. Our headquarters is in California. Our international headquarters is in Ireland. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Here we are talking about uh, semi children, so I don't, I don't think uh, we know. We, we look into these issues uh, through an angle of, uh, you know, jurisdictional tricks. So, as was said, we report directly to NICMEC because we know that NICMEC has direct relationship with law enforcement all over the world and they can act quickly in terms of uh, saving uh, actually the children that is exploited so this is what is happening uh, at the moment why we, we use NICMEC because NICMEC has this kind of context uh, context sorry uh, single point of context in every country otherwise we would uh, like uh, really run the risk to go and talk with uh, a law enforcement that maybe is specialized on technical issues but not uh, on, 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 on you know able to run investigation on a substantial level Overall, there is a problem, indeed, as you said, in trying to find the right balance between terms and conditions that has to be global because the nature of our services is global and the respect of, of local laws, which does not mean that there is a conflict between terms and conditions and uh, laws. What in, in practical terms, mm -hmm. we have two channels. Uh, we can receive a, a referral of a content hosted on our platforms because it's against our policies, and we review this content in relation to this uh, kind of, uh, of referral that we receive. So the content is against or not against our policies. And then there is also the possibility to report content that is considered illegal through a different channel. And in this case, uh, this content is reviewed by legal experts. And then they'll take, uh, of course, in consideration any kind of measure according to the legal uh, jurisdiction uh, in uh, this specific country has to be taken. Do you want to, no, on just a quick thing when it comes to, before we move on to the, the next question, Be, in case of hotlines, what, which are reporting mechanism of what the internet user or the, the person reporting thinks is illegal or immoral, then the, the role of the moderators or the analysts, sorry, is to look at the content and uh, against the local legislation, the one that is in place in the country, define whether the content qualifies as illegal or legal then they would forward on to the police if it's considered illegal by the analysts. So they act as intermediaries. I, I mean, without, I mean, I, I think child p p pornography and those sort of things is a very clear case, but there yes. does still, and, and clearly we're just focusing on that in this session, but there does seem to be an ambiguity in that the, the terms of service teams uh -huh. are making a legal determination. I mean, that's why they're forwarding it on to the US authorities mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. for a law enforcement. At least they're making a prima facie there's prima facie evidence that it has a law enforcement aspect or they wouldn't send it on to the US authorities. And yet it's being done under the ambit of terms of service rather than a legal issue. Mm. No, I don't agree. Issue. I don't agree. It's exactly as a, it's, it, as a user, internet user, if I, for whatever reason, I bump into an illegal content that I think, uh, in this case, is child abuse material, mm -hmm. As not a legal person, I can make uh, the decision to report actually this content because I have a doubt to, to any kind of authorities and without uh, considering my activity as a normal citizen to be considered, a, let's, say, let's say, a legal analysis. It's just as, as our team bumps into a content, they consider that this content is uh, uh, a 
relevant to be reported to the NICMEC, then they do this action. I don't consider this action. Is it more if you have that's a different, uh, different kind of issue, but is is the same the same kind of uh, no, the, the of problem. Actually, in this case, sorry, to, but this in this case is actually the other way around, because in this case the kind of consideration that has to be made is first and foremost from the law enforcement, because maybe they are running an investigation and they want the content to stay up. So on this one, John, I, I think it's it's a very different case. Oh, so sorry, we already had the gentleman over there who was. Uh, in line, and then it, it would be you. Is that correct? Is that okay? In response, can you do you mind holding for a minute, please? Hi, my name is Catherine Bauer Wolf. I'm with the European Commission, and we do a lot of work on these issues. And actually, in terms of the terms of service issue, I mean, the, what is legal and not is stipulated in the law. But what the companies have chosen to do, vis-à-vis uh, -vis also their users, in terms of the inspections that they perform of the materials and the actions that they take, that's the part that's regulated in the terms of service because from the law itself there arises no obligation for these companies to do the monitoring. So also in terms of the transparency vis-a-vis -vis the users, we actually welcome the fact that this is clearly detailed in the terms of service, enabling them to take this action in the contractual relationship with their individual user. And then the reporting obligation is laid down in the US law, and also the scope of the reporting obligation in terms of the illeg illegality of the material is defined there. So that's how it works in terms of the interplay between the terms of, terms of service and the legal structure. I and in terms of the forward Sorry, to the right. national authorities, um, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children has set up a secure computer uh, connection, a virtual private network, so that law enforcement from other um, countries, um, I think something like 90% of the notifications actually go to outside of the US law enforcement from other countries can have access to these notifications directly. And for the EU, a lot of them go through Europol, which cross-matches them against its own database and enriches it with whatever additional information it has available and then distributes it to the member states through a secure connection. May I respond? I think it's very important that we be very careful to distinguish the difference between illegal child abuse images and violations of terms of service. I mean, that's like comparing murder cases with parking tickets. Um, not that terms of service aren't important, but when governments start to require companies to enforce their own ter terms of service, many of which may be a higher standard than free speech laws, or, or you know, in other words, for example, uh, Facebook and Google ban material that is absolutely legal in the United States, but they choose to ban it. It gets very dicey when governments start telling them to enforce these kinds of rules. Uh, when the content itself may or may not be illegal. Well, Fair. no. I mean, <laughs> I have rules on how I treat my children, but I don't want the police coming in and enforcing them. You know. Uh, you know. Well, oh, you didn't do your homework. You're under arrest. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, although some something we should take down. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we have a, a friend here who, who has been waiting to ask a question. We have to move on. Thank you. We have two minutes left. Sure. Uh, I'll be brief then. Chris Gastka, also from the University uh, of Cambridge. Uh, I have to say that having some background in uh, copyright enforcement, I found the whole issue of welfare of moderators quite new, quite fascinating. Uh, the two questions I have are actually focused on um, the procedures, which kind of were touched on by representatives of Facebook and Google. So the first question is to the gentleman from Google. You've said that uh, when you talked about algorithms and their use, you said that 98% of you know finds of matches which you get come from algorithms. Was this about uh, child-related content or was it about content in general, infringing content in general? Okay, now it's working. For high-profile controversial content. Sorry, that was, that was more generic. Yes, high-profile controversial content. So the worst, let's say, the worst of the worst. Okay. Uh, so on to the, the second question, that's um, to the lady from Facebook. You said that you have various teams dealing with moderation of various types of content. Now, is there uh, some kind of a fast track for stuff which is like you know child pornography which is something which is arguably much more abhorrent than, than copyright infringing content is, th is there like a special procedure like a fast lane for that or not there, um, so when you choose the type
write this content that you're trying to report to us and then we triage those reports to the specific teams for reviewing that your answer helps us determine which team it should go to and that determines how fast you need to turn around the time so if it's suicide if it's you know something related to a child safety issue all of those are the top concern buckets and that has the highest turnaround time we also have places on our help center where you could go and get specific forms or reporting those specific types of content which you might require a higher you know faster turnaround and you can go down that route as well both those reports will go to the same teams and those have a very very high turnaround time Okay, and just to just to then to, to build up on that and refer to the, the earlier question, when you make this determination of you know which content gets the fast lane, do you look towards <laughs> your terms of service or do you look towards the laws that you are you know of, of of US or any other country when you make the you know the fast track determination? So I'm not the best person to answer that question, but my understanding is that it's a whole variety of of you know factors that determines that it's going to be about real world harm and you know whether the person needs immediate attention or not and some of these cases are very easy like child safety suicide prevention you know that you have to react quickly thank you thank you so unfortunately we have to wrap up uh, of course uh, I'm, I'm i'm left with the feeling that uh, we could continue talking about that for many more hours which is good i think in a way because it means uh, we definitely need to continue talking about that and organize more sessions uh, whether at the AGF next year or other policy forums. And, and of course, we all aware that only half of the world is connected to in the internet. The other half is gonna be connected, you know, in a matter of, of years now. So this will grow and this topic is not a go gonna not go away. So we really need to um, continue discussing that. Thank you very much to all of the speakers and I look forward to seeing you at another session, another place, another country. Thank you very much.